The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and welcome again to this new webinar organized by the Maternal Health Supplies Caucus of the Reproductive Health Supplies Coalition in partnership with White Ribbon Alliance. You are all muted in order to prevent background noise. This webinar is being recorded and a link to the audio and video will be sent to all members uh, of the caucus in a couple of days and to everybody who is attending this webinar. We will not open the microphone uh, during this presentation, but you are most welcome to write your questions in the questions box at the right hand side window of your GoToWebinar platform. Without further ado, ado, let me introduce our panelists today. Christy Cade is the Acting Chief Executive Officer for the White Ribbon Alliance Global Secretariat. She regularly serves as the Deputy Executive Director and oversees White Ribbon Alliance programs and advocacy campaigns, including acting as co-chair of the Global What Women Want campaign. She previously served as the Director of Policy and Advocacy at PATH, where she was responsible for developing and implementing PATH's strategy for advocacy in program countries as well as advocacy capacity building initiatives. Christy also served as the Associate Director of Advocacy and Public Policy at Pathfinder International, where she oversaw advocacy with U.S. policymakers and capacity building for advocacy in program countries. She helped found the Youth Health and Rights Coalition to provide a forum for the exchange of lessons learned and best practices related to improving policies and programs for young people. Christy received her MPH in International Health from Boston University School of Public Health and her BA in Sociology and Anthropology and Women's Studies from Ohio Wesleyan University. If you have any questions regarding the operation of the GoTo webinar platform, do not hesitate to contact me through the chat box. So Christy, the microphone and the audience is all yours. Great, thank you so much, Milka. I'm thrilled to be here with everyone today and appreciate the opportunity to share with you all about what women want. Um, for those of you who do not know me, uh, again, my name is Christy Cade, and I am Deputy Executive Director of the White Ribbon Alliance. Um, for those of you who are less familiar, um, WRA is a, a global network whose mission it is to propel a people-led movement for reproductive, maternal, and newborn health and rights. We actually just celebrated our 20th anniversary in 2019. And when we formed more than 20 years ago, it was out of the realization that too often the voices of women in countries with poor maternal health outcomes were going unheard, resulting in slow and inequitable progress. Well, many things have changed uh, since 1999. One thing remains as true today as it did then. Meaningful change can only be sustained through the will of the people. As such, in April 2018, based on earlier work in India, WRA launched the What Women Want advocacy campaign. It began with a really simple idea. Ask those who most use maternal and reproductive health services to tell us what they most need. Ask the women, ask the clients, such as Kasime. Oh, 
umutsibira umwirima ubwo mushyira abantu yabira ngine mutuzo mu yigwariro ejyare risate kilometazi ubumuka tabe tujyaho ibyo kintu kishabuza nikishabuza nikishabuza umushyira kuza kutera toki arebegemse tera nduru mushyira tera nduru atera nduru obwe yabenenda kutujyo tabe tujyaho Tuleema toka ya wawenja, nilaba. Mishisha tembeleza, hati mitu yande, mishisha wewe nilaba tutamu, batuara igwari. Okendi kuteka teka nguwe chanyima, nishisha kuja kuguma kuchendete lo kujwa, mkikaku. Kwa honka, kwa mwana wanjaka wahuri hile. I always like to share the, the stories of the women and girls who participated in the What Women Want campaign because they really bring what this movement and this um, work was about. But in the end, What Women Want was more than 350 groups from small community-based organizations to actually giant corporations working together to mobilize responses from nearly 1.2 million women and girls from 114 countries. Although the vast majority of responses came from these eight countries specifically. You can see them on the, the screen, hopefully. Um, Mexico, Malawi, Kenya, Nigeria, Uganda, Tanzania, India, and Pakistan. Um, and really, countries opted in rather than uh, the, the campaign um, selecting countries. Um, it was really intended to be locally adapted and owned, and therefore the, the campaign looked slightly different in every country and every community. Provided with guidelines, templates, and consent forms, local mobilizers took the materials and ran, sending anywhere in from five to 5,000 responses. Some women took photos and videos on their phones and shared their responses via social media. Others sat together and discussed as part of citizen hearings before writing their words on paper, often all making the same choice to answer the question to add more power and weight to their voices. Still in other places, university students, health providers, parliamentarians um, visited different settings from clinics to schools to prisons uh, to ask women what they want. No, but no matter where the campaign took place, no matter how it looked, what held was the question. Um, and a relatively simple question, but one that doesn't get often asked. The open-ended question was, what is your top demand for reproductive and maternal health services? This question really let women and girls set the agenda, as opposed to beginning with the premise of what is important, or asking them to decide among a set of options. Women's answers were often unexpected, you know, challenging assumptions and shining new light on the reality of their lives. Um, I know I was surprised. What I thought was number one was, in fact, number 13. Um, and analyzing, I can, you can only imagine that analyzing more than a million open-ended responses was, was challenging. Um, the responses came in many forms and many different languages, um, but were tried to approach in a very systematic way. Um, they were all translated into English and digitally recorded by national What Women Want focal points. And then these were passed to the White Ribbon Alliance Global Secretariat in Washington, D.C. to categorize them into relevant themes. Um, our analysis began with roughly 50 categories um, from, from the original campaign back in India in 2016. But women's and girls' answers took us well beyond that. Um, Mobilizers sent in new suggestions for categories as they heard from women. Um, still, other categories were consolidated based on volume or recommendations from technical and country experts. Um, in all, there are 61 total categories, and each category has a minimum of 200 responses each. About 70% of the responses were hand-coded um, by trained representatives of the Global Secretariat for WRA. But, um, and we had both country and technical experts make quality assurance checks. To do the remaining 30%, we actually leveraged the latest advances in natural language processing and machine learning to augment the analysis. So just a, a quick bit about that. Essentially, we worked with some of um, our friends at, at Google um, who were able to adapt sort of the, the latest technology to pick up fake news <laughs> to actually uh, help with sort of quoting um, 
recording these responses. So that's a whole other webinar, and I'm happy to talk about it at a different time, but it's often very interesting to people. Again, this wasn't a simple process, but um, underpinning it all was a commitment to ensuring that every single voice was counted, every voice was heard, and these voices were very loud and clear. So without further ado, the number one response globally was respectful and dignified care with a, more than 100,000 responses. This may seem like a small number out of 1.2 million, but with an open-ended survey, you can imagine the varied responses we were received some having nothing to do with health at all. Um, but we heard loud and clear that women want to be listened to, to have an interpersonal connection with their health providers. They did not want to be talked down to or judged. Um, they want compassion as much as any health outcome. The number two response was water, sanitation, and hygiene. Women were clear that part of having a dignified experience included having health facilities with running water, indoor toilets, clean bed and sheets, uh, that they do not have to clean themselves. And finally, the third most popular response, which I'm sure is of a special interest to this community, was simply demand for basic medicines and supplies, such as blood, unexpired drugs, gloves, and cotton. Women and girls, 15 through 34, made up more than 80% of the total respondents. Interestingly, these top three demands resonated across nearly all age groups. The exception was for 20 to 24, midwives was the, the number three response, and that was actually number four overall. Um, I also want to point out just uh, an anomaly relative to menstrual health. Globally, um, across all ages and across countries, it was number 20, but it was number four for those 15 to 19. So what do these results tell us? First, that women want and are demanding basic infrastructure, basic decency. They want this far more than any individual service or solution. Responses from what women want demonstrate that health policymakers, programmers, and practitioners were not meeting women where they are. We should continue to aim high, but if we cannot provide the most rudimentary needs to the most vulnerable women and girls, we will never prevent women from dying during pregnancy and childbirth or creating an environment where girls grow up empowered to understand and direct their own reproductive health. Another thing that's interesting about what these results tell us, in answering the question, what is your number one want for reproductive and maternal health care, women did it silo, but yet as a community, we often continue to do so. Here's a quick peek at the remaining top uh, 20 global responses. Midwives and nurses, you'll see um, that was at number four. Closer health facilities, doctors, um, free and affordable services and supplies. Um, which in this one refers very specifically to sort of general health services and supplies. Um, what's interesting to note when you look at these top responses is that women are asking for things related to broader health systems rather than any singular service. Specific services like antenatal care and label and delivery um, don't really start showing up until the latter half of the top 10 list. And those are much more prevalent in the top 10 to 20. Um, you'll also notice timely and attentive care is another response that speaks to the broader context of care. And we have heard that women are tired of waiting at facilities to receive care, and when they finally do, they're tired of being rushed out. So much um, what we heard about really relates to sort of the interpersonal experience um, of care that women um, have on a daily basis, and that is often what is a predictor of them seeking services um, or returning for services. Okay. So here you can see the top um, 11 to, to 17. Number 12 was just a general, you know, women want improved health, um, uh, reproductive or maternal health more generally without getting very precise about what the, the want was. You see transportation infrastructure um, is also included in the top responses. So family planning information, personal services and supplies is at number 13. One thing um, I would want to bring people's attention to is things related very specifically to adolescent and youth-friendly services were coded um, separately, and many of those responses did include family planning, um, and probably that taken together would elevate family planning to, to number 10. 
another just interesting element is you look at this issue around ethical, lawful, abusive, and secure care. There was a lot of debate about whether that links with respectful and dignified care. What went in respectful and dignified care was more uh, proactive requests for positive treatment, uh, you know, warm reception, friendly nurses, polite. Um, things that actually went in number 14, ethical, lawful, abusive, and secure care related um, towards things that were very, very severe. And I do not want to be hit. I do not want to be abused. I do not want to be discriminated against or coerced. Um, and, and so those things uh, went in number 14. But again, taken together, a lot of this shows how much that interpersonal um, experience matters towards women and girls. Then you'll just see the, the last remaining of the top 20. Uh, number 19, just drawing your attention to that, this sort of focus on needing and wanting more information. Um, information came out quite significantly throughout the, the campaign. If people wanted specific information related to family planning or labor and delivery, antenatal, it connected um, and it was coded as, as part of those responses. This was a, a request for information more, more broadly. And something else that was really illuminating about the campaign was just, you know, the major gaps that still exist in health literacy and how much responses came in that women were simply um, uninformed, didn't, you know, have access to the latest info evidence base or options that were available to them. And it shows um, how much we still need to do relative to uh, those communication efforts. Um, again, we are now actually looking back through the data to, to understand better the themes as it relates to the type of information women are really seeking and the types of ways they want to receive that information. Okay. I'm going to dig in now just um, a bit more to some of the specific um, uh, results. And just first, again, a word on, on young people. Young people's family planning and maternal health specific demands, I said before, were, were coded separately under um, adolescent and youth focus information, services, supplies, and personnel. Um, again, now all youth demands were family planning, but a large majority were. And again, if combined with the family planning response category, it jumped to the top 10 list. Uh, again, number four demand for young people was uh, menstrual health for 15 to 19. What's really interesting to note just about this category was that adolescent youth focused services was the number 12 demand overall for young people. And half of women asking for these services were from women over the age of 25. Um, so despite the focus on adolescent youth friendly services, adolescents are still asking for the same basic things that older women are asking for. And again, do not necessarily bucket themselves in the same way that the larger um, development health community does. Now, really digging into that number three demand, which is of interest, I'm sure, to this group, um, given the supply focus. Um, demands in for medicines and supplies, um, in general, were coded into the medicine and supplies category. If uh, a supply related specifically to like antenatal or labor delivery, family planning, it was coded into to those areas. Um, so again, Taking that together, medicines and supplies, um, the number would be quite big and, and, and far more significant. And we're um, even beyond the top three. And again, we are um, pulling that information out for some more detailed look on um, the supplies and developing sort of a medicine and supplies brief. Digging deeper um, into these categories, again, a lot of the, the first things that, that come up are related to just basic unexpired drugs and equipment. A lot of women, when asked about their maternal and reproductive health, weren't able to categorize or did, chose not to categorize specific equipment they want. They just know they go to the facility and commitment and medicines are, are not available. But a specific thing that came up again and again and again uh, was related to greater access to blood, including blood banks and blood transfusions. Um, and uh, this garnered a, a lot of responses. And this really is particularly relevant to the Maternal Health Supplies Caucus um, and your new work stream on blood. Um, and so that's something we want to pay um, special attention to. But I think it's just a, another good reminder that, you know, women are not asking for the technical or brand names of different medicines and supplies. Um, they simply want more and better medication for their maternal reproductive health. Um, 
which we can then reasonably sort of extrapolate to these specific uh, interventions. Now, digging in specifically to the, the demands related to supplies as they were in the antenatal care and labor um, codes, uh, ultrasound equipment and um, services came up very large. Um, this was sort of the number one sub-demand as it related to, to supplies um, within antenatal care and label delivery, which just a reminder, those were um, number eight and number nine overall for, for top requests. Maternal immunization is another sub-demand that rose up quite high within the antenatal care and label and delivery um, codes, uh, especially in Pakistan. Women often didn't refer to it as maternal immunization, but said things like pregnant women should receive vaccinations. Tetanus toxoid, or TT, was one specifically named vaccine that did come up um, uh, multiple, multiple times, and so we saw quite a bit. Women also asked for um, nutritious diet during pregnancy, um, which you know, reminds our community to think of, of food as a critical supply. Big focus in demanding supplements and vitamins during pregnancy, including iron, folic acid, and calcium. And one of, I think, the just the really interesting things that, that came up that you know we just as a community don't often think about was simply cheese service while delivering and um, uh, and at clinics when you're seeking your antenatal care. But that was one thing that came up. Women just want the availability of food while they're actually um, in their birth centers and their hospitals, especially when they're in um, their, their labor and delivery period. Again, something we often don't think about, we don't talk about, but it was seen um, in here as a reason why some women do not go to the health clinics or go to health centers. Now, looking at sort of the, the family planning code and some of the, the um, supply uh, needs that came out there, an interesting picture sort of emerges from the preliminary data. By large, um, women want just general family planning, not a specific name method, but simply family planning. This is followed closely by basic awareness, information, and education on family planning. Something that young people in particular really want. You know, as a as a maternal health and family planning community, I said before, we you know we often think there's a lot of you know IEC material out there, and there is, but it doesn't seem to be reaching women and adults and girls and meeting them where they're at. Uh, just a reminder that a large proportion of the women and adolescents who took this survey are largely from villages and remote and rural areas rather than capital cities. Free and affordable family planning is another um, sub demand that popped which is timely in light of discussion on commodity financing gaps and UHC more largely. And just regarding specific family planning methods, women were saying that they wanted short acting um, methods like condoms, pills, ejections, and rings more than they were asking for long acting and permanent methods like IUDs, implants, or sterilization. This could be related to the finding that women and adolescents are asking for more information and education about family planning. They simply may not be aware of high effective long acting methods um, to be able to ask for them. Again, really worth exploring and unpacking. We also saw women asking for methods without side effects, although this is a much smaller number. One other place where we saw family planning um, and antenatal care um, and labor delivery merge was under a category of male engagement and family dynamics. Um, some women said they wanted to use family planning or they wanted to seek um, antenatal care, but, but couldn't because of a husband or in-law and needing to seek permission. Uh, again, smaller numbers, but worth noting. Okay. And finally, it's just, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a really notable um, thing that women were just requesting some of the most rudimentary supplies. This is gloves, cotton, and wool. This underscores one of the major themes of the What Women Want campaign, that women are demanding the basics, basics much more rather than um, sort of fancy gadgets or innovations. And while we continue to focus there, we still need to be meeting first and foremost what women are seeking and what they're, they're asking for. Um, again, our preliminary findings show that medicines and supplies is in the top 10 for each of the eight countries that collected the most demands under what women want. 
a couple of things to know. Um, medicine supplies was number one in Tanzania, just edging out respectful and dignified care. And free and safe blood provision was among the top supply asked in Tanzania. Maternal health medicines and supplies came out huge in Uganda. Um, medicines and supplies, it was number two overall, just below labor and delivery, which was the number one request in Uganda. But interestingly, what helped drive this was a request for mama kits, whose marketing as entitlement has been quite successful. Um, just for, for those of you who may not know, mama kits contain basic supplies for a clean and safe delivery, plastic sheeting, razor blades, cotton wool, gauze pad, um, soap, surgical gloves, um, cord ties, such as that. Uh, Mexico, um, top ask for drug and equipment um, with blood banks and ultrasounds being um, the, the sub demands um, within those categories. And then Pakistan and India was also quite big, um, again, with a focus on blood and x-rays um, or ultrasounds in, in both of those contexts. Um, and just uh, a little bit, just so you know where, as the Reproductive Health Supplies Coalition and the Maternal Health Supplies Caucus, labor, delivering antenatal care and family planning, kind of where they came out in some of the different countries. Um, Kenya, family planning was number eight. Malawi, um, labor delivery number 10. Nigeria, family planning was nine. Labor delivery number six. Tanzania, labor delivery number six. Uganda, labor delivery, family planning, antenatal number 10. Again, in a lot of these countries, respectful, dignified care, WASH, um, issues related to uh, midwives and other providers um, were, uh, the need and want for more female providers were big underlying um, cross-cutting cross -cutting themes. Um, just something interesting in Malawi, family planning was, was, was fairly small, um, and again, it had sometimes maybe to do who and was asking the question, but I think this is also very illuminating that um, a lot of work can be done for both the maternal health and reproductive health communities and the family planning communities to really kind of mobilize that um, average everyday voice to to make um, those types of demands and really kind of elevate that and you know investment and focus needs to to go into that area. Um, oops. Okay, uh, so just a, a couple um, more points. Um, the top 20 demand, global demands for, for all age groups are available now for download. Um, go to whatwomenwant.org, um, as well as the results for the top eight countries, um, which includes sort of that sub-demand within the broader categories. I encourage everyone to really visit to review the complete results. As I said, you know, every voice was counted every voice mattered. While demand may only rank number 14 globally, that demand may mean the difference um, in women seeking or not seeking care in an individual country or community. You may be wondering, where do we go from here? Um, as progress on maternal and reproductive health stalls and even reverses in, in some countries, we need to do something different, something radical. Um, we need to Listen to women. Uh, we need to listen to girls. Shouldn't be radical, but I'm really finding it is. Um, you know, when I do this presentation, very often the main question I get is, where is the thing I'm working on? Where does that actually rank? Oh, and or the comment I get is, well, let me tell you what's really important. I know women didn't say this, but this is where they need to focus. Um, but if, you know, I, I leave us with this thought, if we want women and girls to visit health centers, if we want them to adhere to recommend advice, if we want better health outcomes, their agenda needs to become our agenda. As such, we are developing in partnership with mobilizers and women in the eight countries, um, action agendas um, for their top three responses and for um, the top responses globally, which again, a big focus on medicines and supplies. I really hope you join us in developing and advancing this agenda and because it advances your supply objectives. But in addition to supplies, I really hope you also consider, you know, the number one request. Ask yourself, how does your work better help women get the respect they so much want and deserve when seeking health care? It really goes hand in hand with supplies. And ask yourself, how can we as a health and development community make women's demands the basis for our actions moving forward? Also, what needs to be on our agenda? Um, 
uh, a call that really cuts across, that transcends all health and development topics. And it's a call to really listen to women. We need to make it standard operating procedure to have women and girls actively and meaningfully involved in designing policies and programs which are meant for them, and not just a talking point or worse, a radical notion. Um, I want to leave lots of time for questions, and so happy to take questions about the results specifically, but I would love to hear from everybody on the line as well, and specifically, what is your um, advocacy agenda? Is there a way you see what women want and these results being able to um, carry forth and uh, advance your larger supply agenda? Also, are there ways that the caucus, the Maternal Health Supplies Caucus, can focus on um, uh, you know, ensuring that the women's voices are included in your own actions and agenda? And is your agenda kind of evolving and taking account sort of the, the words of women and how we can do that together um, more effectively? So Milka, without further ado, I think it'd be great to, to turn it over to you to kind of facilitate a Q&A. Thank you, Christy, so much. That is such an important report. I frankly, I've listened to this presentation before, but every time I, I come out with, with more um, insights on what really women want. And I think it's, um, it's important that medicines and supplies are among the 10 top priorities for women around the world. That is very revealing. We have so much to do in terms of availability and quality. Uh, the four pillars of the RHSC, availability, quality, equity, choice. Um, it's, um, it's very, very important that people have um, a good look at this report. We had um, a question from Kate Rathermacher, who had to leave. Um, she wanted okay. to know where she could find the report available online, and I believe you have um, already said that. Yep, yeah, you can go to um, White Ribbon Alliance slash What Women Want, or you can go to whatwomenwant.org. Um, but all of the uh, the global report, the country reports for. Um, all but India, Pakistan, and, Mac and Mexico are now available, and those three will go up in the next week or so. There's also additional um, film stories and, and footage there. Um, and as I said, uh, I mentioned that point about the agenda. Those will be forthcoming and will be available in early April um, as sort of like the, the second year of the, the What Women Want campaign. You know, it was launched in 2018, 2019 was when we closed the mobilization and early April we'll be sharing um, those specific action agendas. Um, and also what will be going up there is um, in the next few months is those in-depth briefs on the topical, the topical issues, um, which, you know, medicine supplies would be great to work with um, the caucus on to make sure it's, it's really reflective of uh, the different evidence you're building on and um, as well as women's voices. Um, Kabir Ahmed has raised uh, his hand. So I've opened the microphone for you, Kabir. Come on in. Hi, thank, thank you, Milka. Uh, thanks, Kate. Uh, it, was, it was a great presentation. Hi, you know, Pierre. my... Uh, I, yeah, my, my concern is, you know, uh, uh, I joined it a little bit later, but maybe you have covered somewhere in the beginning that, you know, when you talk about the what women want, sometimes we found during my work with UNFPAs, uh, uh, the menstrual kits or what they call hygiene kits or uh, dignity kits, which contains, uh, you know, all those stuff and some... Uh, uh, cotton, some uh, towel, the, the 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 sanitary pack. Some there was a list of ten things in that, and this was found very. When, when we used to argue, especially during the emergency situation, we found that that was number one demand from 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 a lot of the women in 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 the country. So I don't know. Was there any any of these kind of things came up from the women that you you did your uh, you know. Uh, yeah, you, you collected the from all these 114 countries. 
Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. And and yes, we heard a lot of um, individual requests for a lot of those things that you listed within within those kits. But um, very specifically, uh, in Uganda, um, mama kits um, that included a lot of that were sort of a, a really, really high level ask. Also, a lot of what we did here in um, specifically in a lot of the East African countries, Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania related to um, dignity kits for, for menstrual health. And a lot of what you were hearing was some of the most you know, basic wants um, that related to napkins, towels um, for, for menstruation and also for the postpartum here, um, period. We got a lot for that um, uh, as well. Um, and it was interesting, just in Uganda, just um, in, in the country reports, they, we also tell you where like sort of the subnational data came from. Uh, there was a big focus on a lot of the refugee communities because, as you know, Uganda is um, the number country, the number third country, the most refugees. Um, and a lot of uh, the requests for some of those those elements came uh, from from that population um, quite specifically. But yeah, we we heard we heard a, a, a lot of that. I have another question here from Kelly Blanchard. Can you give a bit more information about methods coding? I am sure it was quite a task to try and analyze this huge amount of extremely useful data and also think that there could be lots of overlap and questions about how to categorize comments like the one yeah. in this picture. Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, Kelly, so I would say uh, just to turn your attention to the, the global um, the, the global report, there's a whole uh, methodology section. So just to have sort of that more detailed. And I, you know, I want to put out there from being, this was really viewed as an advocacy campaign and a voice campaign. This was about really generating demand and, and showing the importance of, of women's voices and, and kind of moving the needle. So it was not a research project. Um, it was you know, framed as, a, as an advocacy project, um, although worked quite you know, closely with some different um, researchers to advise on methodology and approaches. So the one thing um, you know, I should say, if you look at uh, you look at something like this, and um, this might have actually been triple coded. So you know, women were asked for their number one response. Um, but very often, sometimes you'd have some women say one and some would say six, <laughs> you know, everything would get coded. So the total number of responses uh, are more than 1.2 million. Um, but something like this would have probably been coded um, uh, in adolescents, um, supplies, adolescent youth information supplies, um, personnel and services and would likely also have been coded because the judgment was a subcode under respectful and dignified care. So it would have probably been double coded under respectful and dignified care. Uh, and so, uh, and again, a lot of that had to do with uh, partly some of this was hand coded and teaching the, the technology um, to pick up different patterns and, and different, different themes. Robin Churchill, um is uh, makes uh, another an, another question here the kids are great and it makes sense that women want them I, I, the hygiene kids but in the context of huge supply gaps they are often broken into and then when needed they are incomplete the kids alone are not sufficient did you find any links in what women asked for about general supplies and the kits, it would be a shame to provide kits as a response without acknowledging the overall supply gaps. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I think to be mindful, like again, that's not what we're saying as an individual solution. I think it's just important to um, understand kind of what women are seeking and, and searching and kind of also balancing their voices and wants and needs with sort of the larger interventions we know need to strengthen a broader system. I think one thing that did come out that was just really interesting about the kits is um, a lot of women were framing those as incentives. 
um, to actually attend for for innatal care, um, and and so that was I think a we we heard a lot of the supply requests um, that were asked for did relate to to incentives why women would go to um, facilities, and that also included things like buckets. Um, for for water collection or to wash laundry, we heard some things related just interesting to even uh, clothes and um, for uh, and blankets for newborns and things like that as well. And so I think again, it's just it's something interesting to see about what motivates women, um, and again what they are appreciating and what they see as a value and need. And it's going to be really important, I think, for us as health and development professionals. Um, and this is really important for us as we work through the advocacy agendas that relate to what one want is, is striking that balance of very often, you know, what can be seen and viewed as policy enablers that kind of improve the system, but are still often very invisible to the, you know, average women and, and girls. Um, and and so how, again, we kind of meet their their needs and wants as we're also sort of addressing sort of the larger, the larger system challenges and the larger supply challenges and issues. Um, I think just the, I think one thing that's really important, it was really interesting uh, for a lot of these women and girls who were part of this campaign, you either had kind of two responses to just even the more general question. You had a, the, well, I've never been asked before, <laughs> and or I've been asked for my community or my family, but never about what I want, and that was like a really breakthrough revolutionary moment. Mm -hmm. But you also then had the opposite end of the spectrum, where it's like, I have participated in these types of things again and again and again and again, and nothing's different. I never see any visible change, and I never see what I consider important taken into account. Um, and there's just, you know, there's a, a jadedness, and so I think, um, Again, we have to be mindful as we look at technical solutions um, and as we try to advance those, how we also consider the, the daily experiences of women's lives and what, what motivates them. Um, I don't seem to have any other questions um, or hands raised. So let's see. Okay, I might have. Did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, it'd be really interesting just to hear from our end, like how how can we package the information, um, especially as we're you know doing this next deeper dive into the medicine and supplies issue. What would be really useful for you and in the caucus? Um, what would you want us to be looking for? How um, can the information be um, taken up? you know, in a, a mindful way by the supplies group? What are some of your major things you're hoping to initiate that, again, having somebody who can um, connect in and bring sort of the, the voices of community to bear? In what ways would that be useful to you in the caucus? Okay, let's open the question to the caucus members. Perfect. That's great. <laughs> the group is silent today. It's Tuesday, maybe. Come on, people. We we don't have any 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 comments, but um, uh, I I would say that um, this is the kind of information the not just the maternal health supplies caucus needs, but I think all of the working groups and the caucuses at the coalition need. Um, as you said, there are so many things that we do that are completely abstract to the general public. And uh, what they have are very concrete asks. And um, so from, from our point of view, we, we are doing our best to provide advocates with all the necessary um, information and tools uh, to advocate for quality of medicines. I think for us, that for the caucus, for the Maternal Health Supplies Caucus, that is probably one of the most important issues that we face. 
quality of oxytocin, quality of magnesium sulfate, availability of misoprostol, uh, registration of those uh, medicines in the countries. So that those are, um, are, are big priorities. We're also now including blood and blood products. And you have mentioned that blood and blood products is, um, is one of the asks from women. And we have also included in our menu of um, commodities, we have also included antihypertensives, uh, we have included the blood pressure cuffs, and we mm -hmm. have included transemic acid, TXA, which is, um, has just been included in the WHO guidelines, and it's a wonderful medicine for postpartum hemorrhage. So. That's where we stand uh, right now, Christy, and I think that this this report just confirms that we need to continue working in 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 those areas. Yeah, that's really really helpful, um, Milka, and it'd be great to follow up with um, you and the co-chairs and other members as we sort of start preparing this brief to um, reflect on some of those sort of broader issues and and things you're working on as well. Um, and again, we're going to continue to find, um, you know, interesting storylines and, and themes out of this information. Um, you know, it can be looked at in a lot of, you know, sort of different different ways. Um, and so that's something we're we're eager and happy to do. If you know, um, if, if if the caucus would would like us to dig in, and you know, we've done some specific searches on. Uh, very specific types of medicines and, and drugs just to see where that's coming from and why that might be coming from from those individual places because I think has a, a lot to offer in terms of you know programming um, as well as sort of broader broader advocacy. Um, Robin, so Robin Churchill, yeah sorry Robin Churchill just um, um, he, uh, sent a comment I do think the right. point that women are not asking for innovations and gadgets is important and that they are asking for general FB and short acting methods should be messaged to donors. The focus on blood product products should be highlighted. As far as blood goes, we discussed in the caucus the complex complexity of that system and how it extends well beyond reproductive health. Not sure how yeah. to message that one effectively for action. Yeah. Yeah, just a couple, you know, points on that, and that's tricky. That, that, so the, there is a category focus on research and development, innovation and technology, um, and I think the responses in there were a few hundred. And generally, it looks like most of that data came from uh, either members of the development community themselves or women in uh, higher income countries. Um, you know, and I think that's something that, that's a challenge. You know, I've, I've been asked to present in some different um, uh, presentations on sort of, you know, contraceptive and, and technology mm -hmm. issues. And yeah, I was like, to be honest, that's not where the that's not where the information is like pointing us. <laughs> um, uh, you know, but then was asked to like just pick out very specific themes of like you know different health themes that are are, are popping. But it but it is is a uh, is an important uh, conversation uh, um, that I think I think needs to be had. And I agree with you. I think on the blood piece, um, again, it's this idea that women aren't aren't siloed. And again, WASH came up number two right. and asked about your maternal and reproductive health. And these are large systems issues where I think will be really important for our communities to, to join with some of the others who are truly advancing it, especially when there are some of the things that are major cost um, drivers, but if addressed are really truly changing, you know, systems and, and, and health centers. So yeah, um, I, and so I think that is a, a really well taken, taken point, Robin. Okay, then we will give the audience 10 minutes back of their day. And I cannot thank you enough, Christy, for, for doing this and congratulate the White Ribbon Alliance for always um, uh, feeding us with, with great information and great materials to work on. 
So we, um, when I sent the, um, the recording of this um, webinar, I will also send the link to the full report in your website, okay? And thank you again Perfect. for giving thank us you. the time. You, you, you may close yeah, no the problem. webinar. We'll keep in touch, thank you. Thank you so much, all the best. Bye-bye.